Welcome everyone to the Western Meat School webinar series. Today we're going to talk about humane handling from farm to slaughterhouse. And my name is Rebecca Thistlethwaite. I'm the director of the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network. We are an extension based community of practice for niche meat producers and processors, and we're housed at Oregon State University, but we work with a national audience. Um, the Western Meat School is a short course that's uh, organized through Oregon State University professional and continuing education. And we've, we've turned it into an asynchronous self-paced um, short course with 14 modules. And this is going to be module number five. Um, so I'm pleased to have Dr. Ron Gill with us from Texas A&M University. Um, who is an expert in beef handling and, and cattle handling. He also teaches stockmanship courses through, uh, what's it called, stockmanship and stewardship, and works closely with yes. beef, beef quality assurance on that. Uh, and he can tell you a little bit more about himself and his extensive background. Um, but I'm thrilled to talk about this subject because whether you're a meat producer or a processor, uh, it's really critical that in the last 24 to 48 hours of an animal's life that it is handled with care um, as stress free as possible, gets to the slaughterhouse safely, um, is offloaded safely and, um, and tries to live out the last couple of days of his life as stress free as possible, not only for the care of the animal, but also for the quality of the meat. So I'm going to pass the baton off to Dr. Gill now. Take it away. All right. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to get to visit with the group on this topic. And it's one that um, I really enjoy talking about. Uh, my background involves nearly every species of uh, meat animal there is. I've actually run hog operations, sheep and goat operations. Um, studied a lot in, in horses. We won't get off into that. We're not eating them. Uh, but spent a lot of time in the beef cattle, but we still do a lot in all species. And the stockmanship principles I'm going to talk about today apply across all species. A lot of people think cattle are very different than sheep and sheep different than hogs, and they're not. Uh, the, basically, they're the same in the way they respond to human interaction. So with that, we're going to get into talking about how we manage this stress prior to harvest. And one thing I see in a lot of the niche producers, these animals never endure any stress or handling to much extent prior to that last day. And so if you wait until the last day to start trying to work with them, that's when stress can occur because they've been a herd animal uh, their entire life. They've not ever been off the place. And so when you get to the point that you need to capture that value of that animal, it can be a nightmare sometimes. And so we're gonna spend the time talking about this and some stockmanship principles. And I can't just talk about the last day without setting it up a little bit and some of the things you need to do. And Rebecca asked me to talk about on this end of life humane handling practices. And that's where we'll get to and some things that you can do there to really make this work better for you. And these are some of the things we need to focus on. And I, and I agree wholeheartedly, these are really important. You know, what does it need to look like on the farm so that you can get them pinned, sorted? We leave out sorting a lot of times. And sorting is one of the key things in this because they are a herd animal. And when we go to sort them off individually to take them to the harvest facility, that can be very stressful in itself if we've not practiced it and we don't do it correctly. So that whole process, um, we'll, we'll address that just a little bit. But the loading into a trailer, uh, once again, the first time you load one of them, you don't want it to be the last day they're alive. Every animal we want to do things uh, and be successful at it, we train them. For some reason, livestock, we don't think we need to train them to do certain things. And so we'll talk just a little bit about practicing this, this uh, aspect of it. And even on farm movement of livestock is important. And even in under some of the GAP certifications, they, 
they try to completely avoid transport of livestock. And that makes no sense to me. We need to teach them that it's all right to get on a trailer. It's all right to get off of a trailer. And so there's some things we need to do there. I will tell you this, the, the transportation part that actually that trip to town, uh, that needs to be managed better than most people do because it can be very stressful if we're not loaded correctly, transported correctly, stops and starts, temperature, all the other things that go into that uh, can be very stressful. And I've actually seen more, and I, most people do not discuss this offloading. And I really appreciate the fact that Rebecca had it listed in here. I've seen some cattle that almost created a, a con condemnation effort at the local packing plant because they couldn't get them offloaded without using driving aids. And this inspector was extremely critical of that and almost made a man leave with his livestock one time when I was there because they couldn't get him off easy enough and he wasn't going to let them do what they needed to do to get him off. So that's important to go through that. And then this stress and meat quality, I'm not the person that can talk you know, in detail about what causes that, but any kind of stressors will change the flavor of beef or pork or sheep. It doesn't matter, lamb, it doesn't matter. So we have to make sure that we keep that to a minimum so that they do not have an off flavor because of what we did that last day or hour of their life. All right. Uh, any other humane hand? That opens the door up for what I'm about to talk about now, Rebecca. <laughs> this is something that I think to get these other ones done, we have to understand this is a systems approach to managing livestock. It's not a one day deal. It's not uh, some kind of voodoo or hoodoo we're going to do and get these animals to work right that last day. We have to understand that what we do is important and how we do it is important. And I, I'm I love and hate this little sign because it floats around all the time, but people are the biggest problem in handling livestock, not livestock. So as we understand our behavior, we get better at handling livestock. And if you're fighting with someone in the process of sorting cattle, that makes it more stressful on the cattle. So we have to make sure that we can control our emotions so that we don't transfer that over into the, the livestock. And so think about that as we go through this as well. Rick Machen and I put together a paper several years ago. Rick works down at the King Ranch Institute for Ranch Management now, but he used to work for us. And this whole concept of attitude precedes ability. We have to have our mind right and we have to really appreciate what we're doing and, and the opportunity we have before us to work cattle. There's all sorts of excuses not to do things a certain way but there's only the real reason to do them a certain way is because it's the right thing to do okay and all these other factors we talk about meat quality and that kind of thing but also in the best interest of the animal that we're dealing with it takes too long is another one we hear that's nonsense if you do this right it takes less time to go through the process so i don't ever buy in on that and if you're one of them says your livestock are too wild, you're just admitting that you're not handling your cattle properly or your livestock properly. So that don't make that excuse. The pins are not correct. And rarely do we go to an operation where we have to modify a corral structure. There are some that it will help, but if we understand behavior better, we can normally get by with what we have until it becomes unsafe for people or livestock. And then we need to make those, those monetary investments to get that changed. And this whole, nobody will pay me to practice low stress. If you're selling animal, you need all of the yield you can get out of that carcass. The more stress we put on them, the less yield you're gonna have because of shrink and other issues associated with that stress. Not to mention the quality of the meat that you're trying to sell. The whole thing in this between the handler, it, it's interesting to look at all the behaviors and attitudes and job satisfaction and all these things that affect your attitude. And that can instill fear or stress in an animal. It affects productivity and performance of the people that are working the livestock. So 
we've got to make sure that we really work on this. And there was a lot of work done in Australia and there's some reference down at the bottom of this, if you want to look at it, uh, where you can look a little more in depth at this research that was done on the handler attitudes and how it affects the livestock. So good stockmanship, we got to have our ducks in mind. And most of us really do a good job in, particularly in this niche side of it, because we do think about individual animals. It's not just a herd. It's not just forcing things through in a hurry and that kind of thing we see on some larger operations. So sometimes we just preach to the choir in this kind of scenario, but it's really important that we trust them, that they trust us, but they will still respect our presence because we use pressure and release as a way to manage livestock without creating stress. So if they don't have a flight zone or pressure zone, then it gets more and more difficult for us to do the things we want to do. So we can make pets out of livestock and it make it harder on them and more stressful on them that last day when we have to get rid of them. So keep that in mind. Uh, <clears throat> the physical structures, as I mentioned before, is not a key component in what we really worry about doing. I want you to get cattle to work for your livestock. It doesn't matter. I'm going to say cattle inadvertently a lot of the time, but the sheep, pigs, it doesn't matter. Uh, I don't care whose philosophy you adhere to. There's Bud, well, I call them Budites or Bud Williams followers. Uh, we have people that follow Temple Grandin is almost religious in, in both of those camps. And I don't care which one you believe in or adhere to and neither do the livestock. And so <clears throat> the funny part is they both believe the same things. They just don't want to admit it. So. Uh, the behavior principles are exactly the same, same whether you teach one way or another. So that's one of the things that just drives me crazy about this. Uh, <clears throat> what we have to do is adapt what we do to get the livestock to do what we want them to. And just keep that in mind. It's always a human issue, not a livestock issue if we do it right. Uh, as I mentioned this before, a lot of times they're not handled much prior to that last day. Rarely are they loaded, unloaded, hauled, whatever it might be. So keep that in mind. We need to start practicing some of this before it's the last day, sorting them, keep them by themselves for a short period of time, putting them back together. And if one's too stressed out when you separate them, you really ought to haul somebody to town with them, to be honest with you and bring that individual back, that might be his trial run uh, in that process as well. So there's a lot of ways to think about doing this. And you can't wait till the last week, last month to really start this training. Last month, you could probably get some good things done, but you need to practice good stockmanship and practice what you want them to do the last day. Okay, so that has to be done before that. I use this little video just because I like it. And what you don't wanna happen and everybody gets excited about this guy that can do flips and turn circles and do all this fancy stuff. But a lot of times we get enthralled with the fancy part of corrals and uh, way of life and everything else. But very often when you're in this scenario and you're not really paying attention to things, even though this might look really good, and this guy can do some things that I certainly can't do. But a lot of times when you're doing this, you're not paying attention and it can hurt you, okay? And so we need to make sure that we're doing the things we need to do so that we can get the results we want with a very little effort, okay? And I'm gonna play this one more time and we're gonna watch the other guy because Sometimes your animals may not be cooperating and they may be doing what this guy is doing over here in the corner and throwing a fit themselves. But if we're the guy that's just pacing around, not doing the flips, all this guy's doing the entire time, all this other stuff is going on. And he, right there, he just asked for help. And that's just uncommon in the livestock industry to ask for help to get this started. But in all this, it doesn't matter what the livestock are doing. He's just looking for the right position and trying to be ready. So when it's time, he can put the right amount of pressure at the right time and get the desired result. That's stockmanship in a nutshell. And so we can do the right thing 
a lot of times and get things going like they need to. But our main objective is to cut down this anxiety and stress that livestock have. And when they decide to do something, it's not very stressful. Same for us, all species. We'll do crazy things if it's our decision and not undergo a lot of stress. We communicate with cattle through sight, sound, and touch, primarily through sight. And we have to keep that in mind as we work with livestock that that is their main means that we're communicating with them. I use five principles. I'm gonna go through them very quick because this is in a paper called Cattle Handling Pointers. And if you wanna go back and, and look at more reference material on that, you can. The cattle wanna see you. So you have to position yourself in a means that they can see what you're asking them to do. We put a camera on a cow to watch what she was grazing one day and we got the footage back and I was more enthralled with what she's watching. She looks for everything that affects her and where she can remove pressure before she makes a decision on where to go. And they're doing this the whole time we're oblivious to what they're doing. And so we had to realize that when they're, what, whatever we're doing is affecting that cow. So from the time you arrive, your presence is being noticed by cattle. So you have to make sure you're doing the right thing. Another deal and is kind of go around you. You hear this all the time, but it's basically so they can keep an eye on you. So if we want them to go straight, that gets to be a little bit of an aggravating issue. And I'll talk a little bit more about how to change that behavior because we need them to go straight most of the time. They are a herd animal, whether it be cattle or sheep or whatever it might be. Uh, sheep much more pronounced than cattle as far as that herd instinct. So separating one of them is very uh, stressful to them. And so that's where maybe if you can package several to go to the harvest facility at one time in sheep, you'd be better off, maybe even in, in swine. Cattle can tolerate it a little better than sheep apparently can. So just keep that in mind as you're, you're managing your different stock. The fourth one, which is a main way all of this works is cattle want to remove pressure. And I'll do, use a little bit of time here to talk about this scenario. This, these cattle were in a confined feeding operation up in Iowa. They come from South Dakota. And if you'll notice, there's mud all the way up past their knees. And these were in a barn setting with bedding. This guy was so afraid of these cattle, he wouldn't turn them out in this lot so he could clean the bed pack that they were sleeping on. Uh, the, and they were a little wild, don't get me wrong, but he would not turn them out because he didn't think he would get them back in the barn. And he wanted to know what I was gonna do. And I said, I'm gonna turn them out. And so I did, and it was a little bit scary <laughs> to be honest with you, they were pretty wild. But in about 15 minutes, I heard him say, how are you gonna get them back in the barn? Well, I just pushed them away from the barn and they ran back in the barn. And so they want to take that pressure off and that's where they'd been fed and happy the last few days. So it wasn't hard at all. So a lot of times we just have to change our thinking to get animals to do something. But we can use that to do a lot of things. This is a little demo we were doing in uh, Illinois, I think it was. And you can use pressure in what we call a bud box. And I'll demonstrate a bud box uh, because I think it's something that fits within these discussions very well to get cattle or stock loaded. It doesn't matter what livestock it might be. And it takes advantage of these five basic principles we're just talking about right now. And the last one, livestock can only think about one main thought at a time. So you've got to give them time to really focus on what you want them to do, but make sure you have the pressure correct when you ask them to do something and they have the option to go do it. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about flight zone, but all this is based off understanding that flight zone, the pressure zone in that, in this circle where it has the edge of the flight zone. That's a pressure point that we wanna keep that zone around the animal. You don't wanna get it too small or you, it, you wind up in too close a proximity to livestock when you're trying to handle it. So we work on the edge of that flight zone. If it's too big, it makes it very difficult to keep the stress down. So you need to work it down where the animals are comfortable with you being close enough, but still respect your presence. And I've got a video of a minute of a, of a bull that I'm gonna demonstrate that pressure zone. You get a response, but it's not a big one. The other one is point of balance. And that's gonna come into play a lot when we talk about unloading. 
uh, are loading livestock because we want them to move counter flow basically we go down their side they walk forward and so we have to understand that or we wind up getting behind them and trying to push them off trailers push them on trailers and that creates stress we can draw them on with a, what we call a drawing pressure and make this deal work pretty good and i'll demonstrate that in some videos everybody knows what that's a flight zone right so if if your stock that you're going to be taking into the processor has that larger flight zone then that may be a little unhandy when trying to keep stress off of them. So you need to be able to get close to them. And uh, if those fences weren't there, those sheep would be gone, but right now they're all right. We don't wanna have a flat response out of these cattle or sheep or pigs. Uh, work on that pressure zone where we can get them, where we can do something. And this uh, bull, I just walk, walk up to him, be able to put enough pressure on that he'll move away from me. That's all I really want them to do. I don't want them to be afraid of me or anything else, but just enough to move away from the pressure that I'm putting on them. I'm not spending a lot of time talking about vision because we talked about understanding the sight aspect, but we do need to realize that cattle can't see very well except right in front of them. And if, if cattle are always wanting to face you, that means they don't trust you. Uh, any kind of species. And so we see sheep do that a lot. They'll run out and they'll turn and look at you. If they trust you, they'll keep looking away from you and just keep your vision out of one eye. And so that keeps them from turning and facing you. And that once again, goes back to that, keeping them straight, keeping them walking away from you, easy kind of deal. This is an old cow. I wanted to just demonstrate uh, how easy it is to draw an eye and use that for getting them to do things. You don't have to do this. Same thing as hooking on a horse or something else. But I want you to watch this cow's ears and her tail. Every time I put her uncomfortable, she'll switch her ear and her tail, but she'll do it. Sound like a teenager, right? They don't like it, but they'll do it. And so as we look at that, then we can push on an eye. And this is the steering mechanism on a cow, okay? So we can do these things to them and get them to move away from us and this is switching an eye and uh, really getting the animal, if they'll turn their butt to you, it makes it much easier to get them to go do what you want to do. And that seemed like a really simple thing to do, but getting them to move away from you like that is when I know that animals will handle however I need to. And I'm not going to go through these 10 principles in detail either. Uh, we, and that top one is very misunderstood. You don't have to work slow. You just have to be methodical to get things done quickly and be in the right position. It's not about being slow when you do it. Uh, drawing stock to you, we talked about that. Have a place for them to go when you pressure them and getting them comfortable going straight. And you'll see that cow turned away from me and turned her butt to me. She walked straight down the fence. She didn't come back around me. So she's comfortable going away from me. Uh, we're going to wind up behind stock. Uh, that's just most designs put us behind livestock in their corrals. So that's not something we just got to learn how to do. And we kind of work side to side, work in these triangles we talk about. And I'll demonstrate that a little bit more. But understanding if you walk with the flow of livestock, it slows them or stops them. If you go against the flow, it speeds them up or accelerates them. That's important in handling them outside or unloading them once you get them to your location okay and I put this one in there just to emphasize not all people have the same skill set we may all have the same training but some of us just can't execute it at the right moment okay and so understand that sometimes the best people handling stock may not be the ones that are actually doing it uh, and you may need to change that or really work on that uh, livestock want to maintain this visual contact with one another, that herd instinct. Um, concentrate on moving the front of a herd rather than the group. That'll start that draw and that helps in loading, unloading, anything else. And that's why one individual is harder to work than a group because they have a different mindset when they're isolated. This herd contact increases calmness thing about that is you're moving stock to harvest it's important that you do that and I, I pulled this off the 
internet one time just because it fascinated me how many people were behind these cattle and if you'll notice they're just what we'd call milling they're just circling because they don't know they don't have any direction they're just pushing the, the group along that's not what we want to have initiated because that's going to create stress within that herd because there's not doesn't appear to be a purpose and a reason to be going somewhere you just have a bunch of guys pushing you so what we'd like to try to do is create a scenario where these animals will actually work for us and these cattle are actually some i started i didn't go through the whole process of, of showing you how that started but we can work off to the side and it doesn't stop their flow. Now there's 80 head of these big fat heifers coming in. That's the way I want them to come to the corrals if I'm gonna to have to gather. I don't want them at a trot. I want them to walk in calm as they can be. And I'm off to the side directing where the cattle go. And the reason I'm so far away, I can control the front from a distance. <coughs> Excuse me but I can't if I'm behind the cattle trying to push them. Now they're strung out, but it allows them to also keep that calm. They're not bunched together. They're not bumping one another. They're not stepping on one another. That creates a calmness in those animals as well. All right. um, so acclimating cattle, getting them accustomed to what you want them to do is very important. We talked about that numerous times. Also this acclimation, let them know, you know what you're doing. So you better know what you're doing if you're gonna to try to do this and, and learn. There's a lot of good schools, stockmanship schools. We teach a bunch. We have a lot of video training material. I'll have a resource slide at the end if you wanna to try to get better at stockmanship as well. And this process starts, if you're raising your own livestock, start as soon as they're born, moving, pairs or, or groups together helps teach them how to, to move and respond to pressure early as you can. When you're handling the pairs, anytime you're processing, the sorting you do at processing is important. How you ship, that calmness is really, really important. And I'm, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one, but how you start those pairs is very important and keeping that up. Don't worry about the stragglers, they'll figure it out. But movement creates movement. And so if we can create that draw, that allows them to take themselves when we don't have someone pushing them, which is stress, more stressful than it is letting them follow one another into the corrals. And the reason I, and also, I don't really have a slide on this or anything, but the reason this is so important a lot of people in niche markets will use feed to bait their cattle into the corrals or their animals, sheep, it don't matter. That normally works until the day you need to ship them. And that you go out there with the focus of that animal and getting it sorted off and everything else, and they very well may not come to the corral. And so the animals need to be you need to be able to handle them in any manner. And so you can't really rely on that happening. I see it happen so often that you've got a kill date set up and you can't get your animals loaded to go. In today's time, that's a dangerous thing in a, in a business model that you can't get your livestock in because you have that date, you've got to be there. And so we change our focus on that last day and we know we have to get things done. So we really push to make sure that happens. And so make sure you can do this stuff we're talking about outside and don't just rely on using feed or bait to get the animals into the, into the corral system. It doesn't work to lead them on trailers and you're going to harvest and it's sure, they don't, I've never seen one of them yet let you use feed to get them off a trailer at a packing plant either, but maybe they will. I just don't want to be that one doing it. So. Keep that in mind, keep things going the best you can. And uh, this is one, this is actually an earlier video to that one I've just showed before getting these cattle started. Because once you get them started, notice I'm working from behind this little group that's coming across the bottom of the picture. I had started earlier on the other side of this little pasture, but just trying to get these cattle to come together as a group and work as a group. Then I can take them in and do whatever I need to 
from that standpoint. So it's interesting. You've got to put enough pressure on them to make them go where you need them to go, but you can also put too much pressure and they'll actually respond by going the opposite direction or running off. And I, I can tickle every time I watch this, because I always tell everybody not to worry about the stragglers, but I'm always looking back to see if the stragglers are coming. So if, if you really want something entertaining, watch video yourself working livestock. You're, it's pretty entertaining. Uh, and this is one where these cattle that were coming into the group, they could turn the whole thing around on top of me if I wasn't careful. So it's wherever the pressure's coming from the most. But as these others start bumping into them, you'll see they start turning around and then I'm gonna start movement going forward. And I, I wanna go through this whole process because if you're having to do this by yourself, uh, then you need to understand these principles very well. Right now, all but two have turned and are going the right direction. So at that point in time, I can act, I've, I assume that they're gonna go forward. Now those last two are turning. Now notice I've left the group. One, I, this little heifer on the outside, she finally turns loose of me with that right eye and goes back to the group when I get that far away from them. But the reason I turned out, look what's happened to the front. If I had not left the back when I did, they would have run away but by being that far out, I can control the front and get those cattle to go where I want them to go. And so that previous video that kind of took over from this point, those cattle going on up the fence, but you work them, once you've gotten movement, until I stop it, they're gonna continue moving. That's because they've been trained to do that, okay? <clears throat> All right, we're gonna, skip through some of this in the interest of time. It's the, our job is to control the direction of movement. That's the biggest thing. Well, we can talk about things in corral systems or not. Uh, this was actually another demo and I, I want to talk about how easy it is to get stock to go do things. This was a little set of cattle that had not ever been worked with till I, they unloaded them. And they were a little bit, uh, they'd scatter real easy. So just getting them to group together was the first thing. And I say that if you're not in an intensive grazing situation, sometimes your cattle don't group very well. And so that's a problem you might get into and in get them to come together as a group. But these little set of heifers in about 15, 20 minutes, they got to where they would work really nice. And I want them to look at this gate that's over here on the left side of the screen. And all I'm doing is bumping them around to get them positioned so they can see me when I'm getting ready to open that gate. So as you can place cattle, and we do the same thing in placing them in grazing situations. You can take and place them somewhere and they'll stay there if they are accustomed to the pressure that's gonna be placed. And it's interesting, they're watching me to see what I'm gonna do and they could very well run off, right? There's nothing to keep them from leaving other than the fact that they're drawing, I'm keep that drawing pressure going toward them. So we see people all the time that have to have all their gates set before they bring cattle in. You should be able to bring your stock in, position them in front of a gate, start them again and let them go in. And so this is just a, kind of an end result of 15 or 20 minutes of working with these animals. I'm gonna start one and let them be the lead and draw the rest of them in. And to me, this is the fun part of getting where you can do this when you've got that much control on them, and if they start hesitating at the gate, I'm gonna put a little more pressure on the back. All I, you see how little movement I had to have to get that additional pressure and movement, but that keeps the front from stopping at the gate and keeps everybody moving through. So those are some of the things I think are fun about stockmanship and getting them to go where you want them to go. And this whole pushing cattle away from where you want them to go when they turn around, take the pressure off, they're going the direction you want to, you just manage where it goes. So this is kind of talking about processing and loading, same scenarios in both of it. And most of these, we have sweep tubs. A lot of people stay back there and push the sweep gate around and a few other things. That's normally not what you need to do. You need to work from the front, draw the cattle out of there, just like we've been talking about and you do it the same way every time you work from the front, draw cattle towards you. This is just showing how to, I modified that existing sweep system uh, to get cattle to, to work in, because that system is not very good from a design standpoint, but we modified it to get 
kind of a return box where they go past where they need to go and flow back. And now it mimics basically what Dr. Grandin recommends in that 270 degree sweep. So most sweeps are built at 90 or 180 and they don't work very well because of that. And then they, Dr. Grandin gets blamed because sweeps don't work. Well, they're not properly designed if that's the case. This is now the cattle will come back around the gate. When it, they do, it'll put me at the front. I can put pressure on the front, get my movement started. And then I can keep that pressure on them until they go all the way around the gate. I'm not worried about the gate. The cattle are gonna go because I'm putting pressure on them and they'll funnel in there very easily. So there's different ways to, to think about how we use equipment. Now, there's also a good lesson I brought too many and they wouldn't all fit up the lead up to the shoot. All right, so point of balance is a big deal. Uh, work from the front, draw them down their side. And we talk about this all the time. You start from the front, that could be a loading shoot, squeeze shoot, whatever, walk down their side. But when you go back to the front, you need to walk away from them. Just like me riding off in that pasture away from the cattle that takes the pressure off and it doesn't stop movement. If you go right up their side, you stop their movement again. So same thing in a chute, but we see people always get behind cattle and try to push them into a chute or try to push them onto a trailer. Curve system, it doesn't matter if it's curved or straight, the cattle work the same. <laughs> and we just need to quit worrying about how it's designed. <coughs> Excuse me. Some people don't know what a bud box is. I wanna go through that because it fits a lot of loadout situations. I think it's very important that we actually understand how these work because a lot of people are putting them in and they don't work them right and they say the system doesn't work. That's not the case. So you bring cattle in, they turn around, come around you, you put pressure on the front, they follow one another and that's that five basic principles we just talked about. It can be designed a lot of different ways. Now I've got some videos, different species using them. These are some cattle coming out of a preconditioning facility. And I am, I'm gonna turn the, maybe turn the sound up on this one. It may not, all right. Anyway, all I do is click. And this is a interesting set because you've got to get all your motion going the right direction or it doesn't work. And as these go up, I got the truck driver to get out of the truck so he didn't stop flow. A lot of them really like to get in the way. And so when you're loading stock, you need to make sure people aren't the problem. And these cattle just, they're going on the truck, nobody up there going up the ramps. Everybody says, well, they'll stop and they hit the ramps. Not if you send them right, they won't hardly ever stop. And so using your position and your pressure, you can get cattle to flow really nice out of one of these systems. It actually works better with sheep and goats than it does with cattle because of the way they, their herd instincts, once you get them started, <laughs> it's really difficult to even stop them once they start. And this is just a very simple, you do it with portable panels. You can do it what, and you can load cattle with portable panels. You notice that facility before wasn't solid sides. It had shadows everywhere. It didn't matter to the cattle. It matters to people a lot of times. Step to them, get them to come around you. This is a great example of how a bud box works for sheep. It could be going to load up, processing, whatever. And I found this one on YouTube, which just fascinated me. This guy says he used to load out that end where the light is down there. Now these big fat butcher hogs, uh, they can be a pain to be honest with you, because once they decide they don't want to do something, they really can decide they don't want to do anything. And this fella, he does a pretty good job until he, he slips up right here. He thought he had him, right? <laughs> Anybody ever have hogs and have that issue? Slips back out on him. But he doesn't lose his cool. And the reason I like this video is because he doesn't lose his cool. The other hogs are fine up there. If they would cover that daylight up back there under that door, it would probably help. Animals go to daylight. And so they had gone in and watched some Bud Williams videos on bud boxes. And so they thought they'd try this out of this old barn or house. I'm not real sure what this used to be. <coughs> excuse me but the same principles work with any species they've got daylight to go to it gives them time to think that's not an ideal loadout for hogs is it 
And how many people scream and fuss at hogs when they're loading them? They're curious. They want to go to a new place. They're actually very easy to load if you give them the right setup. And so think about these kind of designs. It takes advantage of their natural tendencies. And so it makes it a whole lot easier to get them to go do what you want them to do. And I'm going to get close to the end here. We'll load a trailer right quick with some these big fat heifers. And then we'll probably be ready to take some questions pretty close to the end of this. But this is a box and these heifers have been hauled from place to place. So it's not that this is the first time they get on a trailer. But there's some things I wanted to talk about in this process as well. I'm gonna split this load and use the partition gates. I don't know how many cattlemen I know don't ever wanna close a partition gate. They wanna just cram everything on there. And for every gate you close in a trailer, you can haul one less animal. I understand that. But if you don't close them and notice these cattle are going to the front, they're not fighting it, not doing anything else. They're still going forward when I get there to close the petition gate. I don't know how many times I've seen people load trailers and they got somebody on one side slamming the gate, slinging it across, ropes pulling it across. If your stock work right, they'll be still facing forward when you get there to close the gate and they're not trying to come off the trailer. It's where they wanted to go and you didn't force them on there. And so set it up to be their idea and it works pretty good. Now I'm not splitting the back compartment. You could if you wanted to, but with this scenario, I didn't because of the way my gate set up, this is one of those deals that's not right. I should have the gate swinging to the outside so I could close it behind the cattle without having to reach in behind them. You'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. Notice these heifers, I'm having to use a little bit of touch, very little sound, but they're following one another onto the trailer. And so if I'm loading them up to go to market, that's what I want it to look like. The facilities are decent enough. That's all portable panels, by the way. Uh, I have them walk over an old WW portable chute. It's rickety and the floor's bad in it, but it, it helps. And then when I get to the packer, normally they offload at a different level than what you loaded. Either it's a greater jump down, it's a slick surface, whatever it might be. So teaching cattle to get off of a trailer is just as important as teaching them to get on it. And when if I'm gonna take these cattle off this trailer, I'm gonna push them away from that back gate, give them room to turn around and give them time to turn around and find that opening before I put pressure on it. So as with everything, timing is really, really important. And if your timing's off, it doesn't matter what the principles were. <laughs> okay, don't be that guy. Uh, I like to keep this a little lighthearted because we can get pretty serious about it, but his timing, he had a great idea. His timing was just off. So a lot of people will try something and because their timing are off, that, then they'll say it didn't work. And so that's what I want to think. It's not working. Was it your timing or was it didn't work? So if it doesn't work, you need to get a little bit better. This is a resource page that we can look at. Uh, send me emails if you need to. That top email address is the best one right now. I think they're gonna change us to the one on the bottom. So I went ahead and put that on there as well. Our beef.tamu.edu has the publications I've referenced here before. And then we have a lot of YouTube resources uh, at ranchtv.org. Uh, there's a website there that links to some classes we have. And then we have quite a few stuff on YouTube on a ranch TV channel. Uh, and we have a playlist there just on stockmanship and cattle handling. So that's another place you can get some, some additional training. And then we do trainings for NCBA called Stockmanship and Stewardship. That's kind of how Rebecca got a hold of me, I think, through this process. And we're going to be in Elko, Nevada. Uh, so if you just search stockmanship and stewardship, there's actually a, a web page dedicated to those trainings. There are two day opportunities to come in and learn something about stockmanship and other production practices in your area. So Elko will be the one in that area. And then we are coming to Orlando, Oregon, I believe it is, uh, to do another one. So we'll be up in the, the Western States uh, a few times this coming year. All right, with that, Rebecca, I think I'm getting close to my time. I've never been on time that close in my life. So 
appreciate the fact that I tried. You did amazing, Ron. Um, so yeah, we have about 15 minutes for questions. So if folks can pop their questions into the Q&A box, that would be best. Um, one comment here, Susan Beal says, this has been beautiful to watch and hear. I very much appreciate that you did this presentation and you're doing this larger work. Functional poetry in motion. Yes, I love watching you work with the animals. Um, it's pretty amazing how, how subtle, subtle those movements are. Uh, one anonymous attendee asked, I'm working with some folks that, ra that are raising yaks. Will these principles apply the same way since they are herd animals as well? What do you think, Ron? Yes, they will. Uh, bison work effectively as well, using, in fact, better doing this. Uh, bison, if you're raising them in niche markets, you sure need to employ some of these techniques to get those things where they're safe to handle. Uh, but yes, yaks, bison, all of them, will, it'll work on all of them. Is there any differences because um, some of these species, like especially yaks, are, are definitely more wild uh, type species and are as used to humans? Or can you change that situation with a herd just by working with them regularly? You can change it with the working with them regularly. I will tell you when you first start, um, it's pretty scary sometimes <laughs> on large herds of bison. Uh, because they will mm -hmm. kind of challenge you a little bit. The yaks, I don't have any personal experience with yaks, but I suspect they would be very much the same. But having a presence around them to start with without having, just going out and positioning yourself somewhere and to where they'll move away from you. As soon as they move away from you, quit the first time. And then you can go back and you'll probably be able to get closer to them before they move. But always let them know if they move away from you, you'll quit. And that's that release of pressure. And then you might be able to apply it two or three times, get them to go somewhere, go apply pressure, get them to go somewhere else. And so you start working that and then they get to where they don't mind you being so close because they know you're going to release pressure at some point in time. So you've got to do that and remember also to go in straight lines. I had that on the slide, but I didn't touch on it. If you go in an arc, that mimics a predator move a lot of times yeah. and circling a herd. And so going straight lines kind of away from them or across the herd until they, they get used to you coming a little bit closer. That's a great way to work yourself closer to one of those herds without putting direct pressure on them. Mm -hmm. Susan Beale also mentions that yaks have large flight zones and in her experience, they don't like being pushed around very hard. So that's good to know. Nope. And, and they, they would, any of those that have a very sensitive flight zone, they will draw a lot easier than they will push. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll push, they'll run away from you, but you don't have any control over them. So those you can start using that drawing pressure and working more from the front and getting some flow started. Mm -hmm. now, now I'm wanting to work some yak, so I'll have a better <laughs> answer to this. I've worked everything else, but I haven't worked yak, so I need an invitation for that one. Yeah, we have a few producers in like the Rocky Mountain states raising yaks. Yep. Um, Sarah asked, do you have any resources to recommend specifically for pastured pork producers? I have systems that work, but I know they could be better. Now, if we're talking about that transportation away from there or exactly what Sarah's asking there. Uh, probably, probably like pasture. sorting, loading, stuff like yeah. that. The, the loading part, I'd still set up some kind of bud box. You can do it with portable panels and don't make it too big because you need, need them to respond to you. And then, you know, just like handling any kind of pigs, if they get fussy, I, I like a board you know, that guy was carrying a cane or something you can use to kind of push and drive and aid. Don't be afraid to use a driving aid. It's not going to hurt them. A board is better than nearly anything for a pig just because it blocks their vision and they'll move away from it. But most of the time you don't even have to do that. But trying to have some kind of, and to be honest with you, when I was running pigs, we sorted them basically the same way we did cattle. We'd let them come to us and we could sort through sorting gates because uh, I actually had a fair to finish operation years ago. And so we sorted 
fat hogs off and took them to the packer uh, all the time. We didn't just clean a whole pen out. So th they sort very much very similar, just have a small gate where you can let the ones through that you want out into the loading area and you can hold the others back. Uh, so I don't think it takes anything spectacular on systems to get that done. Just have a, uh, and I like sorting between pens rather than in an alleyway a lot of times so you can get those cattle in a comfortable setting and just sort them out of their uh, existing pens into a loading setup, whether it be panels or whatever it might be. I will say having been a pastured pork producer myself, we did get our, our pigs really used to the trailer. Uh, we would let them, we'd park the trailer in their pastures and put feed on it and just leave the gate open and just let them sniff around and get used to it. Sometimes we'd find them sleeping in there in the morning, just get them really used to the trailer so that on uh, days to the slaughterhouse, they didn't have any issue getting on the trailer. So, and they were very food motivated too. <laughs> yeah, right. Hence the lame pig. Yeah. Uh, but it, I, uh, I agree. They hog swine are probably more sensitive to change in, in environment than some of the other species are. And I don't really know why that is, but they are very apprehensive of something completely new. So that try to keep the trailer from being a novel activity. Mm -hmm. And even if your your loading facility, if you want to set some panels up and mimic what that would be and just let them go back into their pen, maybe you know, set it up and, and let them load themselves through there because they're just as curious as anything else. They'll work through that system and, and learn how to use it on their own. Um, Sarah's saying she, she puts up hog panels inside her polywire paddocks, but she'd like to see other designs for sorting and loading. Would you recommend like a bud box just with smaller, smaller sizes and smaller gates? I would. Uh, there is a that's what I would try first. There's a, a sweep system. It's a 135 degree sweep. It's a much smaller one. And I've seen some for sheep and I've seen them for swine mm -hmm. that you can, some of them have, have them portable where they can take them in the pasture and, and use them. And it takes advantage of the same behavior principles. The cattle, the stock will go into that little 135 degree sweep. When you close the gate, it actually comes back. They come back the same way they went in. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you're having trouble getting them, I'd look at that. I don't recommend everybody put in a bud box because sometimes the stock just don't work that way. And so a sweep gate can ensure once you get them in there, you can get them loaded. And so uh, look at that. There's you know, Prefort makes one, Titan West makes one, Foremost makes one. And then there may be some from the small stock standpoint that I'm not aware of. Okay. But the 135 degree sweeps work really well. Okay. And uh, Tatiana says, my cattle are a bunch of old show heifers and their flight zone is pretty much non-existent. I can get them to move with noise, but is that recommended? Well, she has brought up my bane of my existence. I hate show heifers and we <laughs> had a bunch of them just because they won't move. And I hate's a strong word. Uh, but if I'm ever going to use a driving aid on an animal, it's going to be a show effort mm. because you've got to build that flight zone. I've actually even used hot shots on them, just very good timing to make them get to where they'll move away from me and respect my presence. Because what we've done with show heifers is completely remove the flight zone. Mm. And so it's our fault that we've lost it. So noise is not a bad thing. Tatiana, go ahead and use it if it works. But when they move away from you, this other thing about gentle cattle or gentle animals, we'll make a move, they'll move, and then we stay right on them. There never is a release of pressure. I'm learning this as I go too. So if you make noise and they move, let that be the end of it for a while. And then you can get to where you can make noise, get them to move a little further and add distance to it. But you want them to know that when you do something and they move away from you, that's the response you want. And show cattle, it's very difficult to get that built back in them. I've had people take uh, like pom-poms or streamers or something like that and scare the bejesus out of them so they'll jump and move away from you. And that helps teach that bump that you want them, when you bump that flight zone or pressure zone, they'll move away from you. 
So it takes more work on gentle cattle than it does. And th this is the danger of getting cattle too gentle in a niche market is when you need them to go get on that trailer, it may be a wreck mm. to get them to do that. And you have to do more to them than you want to or should that last day. So like you make noise, let them move and stop, make noise, let them yep. move, stop like that. Yeah, yep. because they move slow when they move away from you. Mm. So if you just keep going, as soon as you get them going, there is no release of pressure. Mm. So it's just a different, pressure uh, and so that's where trying to teach them to move away from you let that happen and then come back and do it again in a minute you, you don't have to wait till the next day but if they move away from you let that be the reward so i have a question for you so you show up to the slaughterhouse and you know you've handled your animals beautifully sorting them loading them everything's gone swimmingly you're at the slaughterhouse, they have a specific time slot to get your animals through. And for some reason, they don't wanna get off the trailer that day. Uh, what do you suggest in those situations? Uh, th that's a tough one because one, sometimes you're limited very much in what they'll let you do <laughs> at a packing plant. Uh, and so I always try to have a trailer that I can move cattle to the back of or whatever it might be and close partition gates where you can work them to the backs so that because they'll have a tendency to get in the front of a long trailer and just sit there and look at you. And you can't really get in there and put pressure on them. Uh, that's where you can might use some streamers or flags or something like that. The thing to do is to put pressure away from the, the trailer gate. And so if you've got a partition gate closed, you kind of pressure them up against that gate and then the release of pressure would be to get off of it. Mm. It doesn't always work that well, mm -hmm. but it's, it's worth trying to do that uh, because you got to create more pressure on the trailer than they perceive off the trailer, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so that's a little backwards from what you'd like to think, but. Once again, kind of push them away and then get that flow started coming back toward the out the gate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. Well, we're basically, oops, we're at the end of our time here with Dr. Gill. Um, maybe we can get your presentation slides if possible, because you had to go through yep. some of them uh, pretty quickly. But that was a lot of information you packed into an hour. We really appreciate it. and. Even though you do extension for Texas, will you take inquiries from other states? Oh, absolutely. I yeah. may not answer them, but I'll take them. <laughs> yeah, you're a busy guy and probably in, in high demand for your knowledge. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I learned a lot and uh, I'm gonna turn the recording off.